Identity is defined as the characteristics that determine who and what a person is. And we're all on this journey, aren't we? Or as I like to call it, a race, trying to discover who we are. Some of us are scaling corporate ladders. Others of us are hanging diplomas on our wall. But we're all asking the same question. How do I win at this race called life? And I want to plant a crazy thought inside your head. What if our identity isn't forged through moving upward and greater and greater success? But what if it's actually found in descending downward? As a kid, I hated history class, but there's one term I vividly remember. It's the term upward mobility. And upward mobility, all that really means, it's the increase or the upward slant of one's social status. In a nutshell, it's the American dream. Education, check. Good job, check. Lots of money, check. Beautiful spouse, check. Big house, check. And just for kicks, let's throw in 2.5 children, a white picket fence, and a dog. But the thing about upward mobility is it's like this ravenous beast. It's never really satisfied, and it's always demanding something of us. More. More education. More money. More power. More time. And more fulfillment, right? I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Henry Nowen. Well, the truth is, I've never really met him, but I've read so many of his books, I feel like I know him. Henry was a Dutch Catholic priest, and he dedicated 20 years of his life teaching theology at the most prestigious universities in the world. Notre Dame, Yale, Harvard. He climbed up, up, up the ladder of success. But something was missing. He struggled with depression. He wasn't satisfied with his life. And a friend invited him to Ontario, to a home for mentally disabled, which he ran. And during that week, Nowen was just in awe. He was mesmerized by the love and the sense of community that he felt in that place. And he did something that's mind blowing. He literally resigned from his job at Harvard. He packed up all of his belongings and he moved into this home and spent the last 10 years of his life living with the intellectually disabled. During this time, he wrote several books and he introduced this radical idea of downward mobility. And it's really just the notion that true fulfillment in life isn't actually found by fighting your way to the top, but rather making your way to the bottom and loving and serving others. So back to my initial question, how do we win at this race called life? Well, Harvard actually did a 75 year study. That's a long time. And in this study, they followed 174 people from all different backgrounds of life. And the clearest message that they concluded from this study was this one thought, that the quality of a person's life is directly proportional to the quality of their relationships. So in a sense, fulfillment is found and relationship. Pew Research Center conducted two separate surveys in 2017, and they were trying to ascertain what constitutes a meaningful life. 69% of Americans actually said that they found their greatest sense of purpose with their family. So what if all of this striving and this climbing and this demand for more is actually pulling us further and further away from the life that we so desire? 
What if fulfillment is like right under our nose and it's in loving and serving the family that God's given us? So back to my race analogy. I'm an avid runner and any race I've ever competed in, it always starts at the same place, the starting line. So what's the starting line look like in life? It really just consists of your family background, your social and economic status, and even your quirky family traditions. But sometimes those starting lines can be blurry. For some people, they don't have any information about the family history and background, or other times it's withheld from them. And that makes navigating the next leg of your journey really difficult. And that's how 440,000 kids in the U.S. foster care system feel. They have a poor start, and most of them have a hard time finishing their race well. So on November 16th, 2018, my alarm went off at 7 a.m. I rolled out of bed, I peered out the window, and I realized we were experiencing the first snowstorm of the year. So, like, schools all around the North Country were canceled. But rather than shoveling my driveway or hunkering down, you know, with a cup of coffee and a good book, I actually laced up my running shoes. I strapped on my headlamp. And like Forrest Gump, I said, I just feel like running. But all kidding aside, I really actually set out to run 110 miles in a 24-hour time period. Now you might be thinking, what in the world would possess someone to attempt such a crazy feat in the middle of a snowstorm? But in order to explain that, I have to tell you a little bit more about the race me and my family are running. So back in the spring of 2012, my husband and I started this journey to foster with the hopes of adopting. We had two beautiful biological children of our own. But there was something always in my heart, even as a teenager, that just burned to adopt. I always blame it on the fact that I must have watched one too many Hallmark movies. I'm not sure. So Soso Services contacted us and they said there was a newborn baby boy that needed a home. We were ecstatic and scared out of our mind all at the same time. So. Probably a week or two later, just as we were starting to get into the swing of this thing, I surprised my husband and myself with a positive pregnancy test. So we had this newborn foster baby and one on the way. I mean, we always joked that we wanted a big family, but just be careful what you wish for. I remember I was about six months pregnant and I was like rubbing my giant belly and I was complaining about my sore, you know, swollen ankles while I was on a visit with my foster child's biological mom. And she looked at me and she said, oh, I know how you feel because I'm pregnant again too. <laughs> so within a year's time, my family of four went to a family of seven and we ended up having three babies under the age of one. Do you know how many diapers that is? 400 diapers a month. We did the math. And two years later, we were able to adopt that sibling group of two and welcome them as a part of our forever family. And our story should just end there, right? We lived happily ever after amidst our piles of diapers, the end. But the point is, the more me and my husband started to learn about the foster care system, we just saw this huge need. There's currently 440,000 kids in care. And in that group, there's 125 children that are actually freed to be adopted. They have no ties to their biological family, and they're stuck in this system, going from foster home to foster home. That number disturbs me. That number keeps me up at night. How in the world, in a country with the most educated, the most blessed, and the most wealthy people, 
a country filled with 123 million family units. How could we not rise up and take care of this need? 123 million families and 125,000 kids. Those two numbers just didn't equate with me. So this has become a mission, a core part of my identity, to be their voice and to shed light on this huge need. So on National Adoption Day, I ventured out into this snowstorm and attempted to run 110 miles to represent the 110,000 kids that were currently needing to be adopted. I don't know if you guys have seen that classic Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Well, I felt like I was teleported into that final scene where George Banks, his life is granted back and he's so joyful. He ends up running through the snow-covered streets of Bedford Falls, just yelling to everyone and everything, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. I mean, as I was running, there were farmers stopping their tractors in their fields to cheer me on. And there was these police escorts that would come out of nowhere to lead the way. Parents and their kids stayed up late at night waiting on their porch just for a chance to see me run by and wave. This is what I was made to do. But around mile 70, it was 3 a.m. And honestly, I could barely walk. I had worn these metal treads on the bottom of my sneakers in order to not slip on the ice. And I didn't think about the impact that that would have. My legs and feet were swollen like balloons. So under the discretion of my husband, I had to bow out and not finish the run. I felt like a failure. But what I didn't realize was that the ripple effect that was happening already in the community that we lived, my message was spreading news articles and radio interviews would follow. And my inbox was just flooded with people asking me questions about how they became a foster parent or a certified adoptive parent. And I realized it didn't matter how many miles I had run. It didn't matter how high I climbed up on a ladder. All that mattered was the lives that were gonna be changed. So every one of us is gonna get to that finish line one day. Mother Teresa said, when we die, we're not going to be judged by how many degrees we earned or how much money we made or how many great things we've done. We're going to be judged by, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was homeless, you welcomed me in. So what does your finish line look like? Are you going to spend your life striving and climbing this never-ending ladder of success? Or are you going to focus your energies pouring into people around you? You may never become a missionary and move to India and take care of orphans like Mother Teresa. You may never be able to pack up all your stuff and move into a mentally disabled community like Henry Nouwen. But you know what almost every one of us can do? Open our home to a child in need. I just want to end with this last quote. It's my favorite quote. And it's by Edward Everett Hale. It says, I am one, but still, I am one. I can't do everything, but still, I can do something. And I refuse to let the fact that I can't do everything stop me from doing the something that I can do. Thank you.